My name is Greg Moore. I'm a uh, adjunct professor here at Arizona State, and I'm an editor across the street down there in the big funny shaped building, the Associated Press. I'm just going to introduce our speaker today, Lou Ferrara, managing editor and vice president, the Associated Press. He takes care of sports business and entertainment, lifestyles, interactives, and he oversees coverage of some of uh, the biggest events in the world. The Olympics, the World Cup coming up in uh, Brazil. And so he'll be speaking to you uh, about those areas of coverage, and then we'll be able to take some questions. So I'm hopeful that Mr. Cannavaro <laughs> and Ms. Bilker might have a couple questions, uh, or anybody else who's interested in sports, business, entertainment, uh, or the news business in general. Um, you said something in a speech recently that I saw online. I hope I don't steal it too much from your presentation. You've got to be a journalist. And it's not about just knowing how to cover a game. It's about knowing how to tell a story. And I'm hopeful that you touch on that a bit. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me OK? Um, so did anyone background check me before I spoke today? Did any students look me up? Anyone have any information about me in the past couple days? No one's looked anything up about me on LinkedIn. Anything at all. So I got married Saturday. Aww. My wife Mary is here. So if you talk about a changing news business, here's the thing about this. Um, I didn't just tweet that or post that uh, to my various pages. It, it did appear in the New York Times, and no one here saw it. So that should say something. Uh, one, you need to read the style section more, um, because Things do happen there, believe it or not, and you want to know who's doing what. But um, anyway, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight, despite your lack of journalism integrity on researching me before I came here. Uh, it's actually a pleasure and honor to be here, and I'm going to start with a question I ask myself fairly regularly, which is, um, you know, it's actually two questions. Uh, who am I and why am I here? And uh, Greg answered the uh, why am I here or who I am. Um, you know, and I have a great job. And the second question of why am I here, I ended up reconnecting with Chris Callahan, your dean, and he asked that I come to speak here, and I asked him, you know, talk about what exactly, you know, what do you want me to convey to students? He was very kind to me and said, you know, from the last time I saw him, which was 20 years ago at the University of Maryland, uh, when he tried to lure me from the college paper to the fledgling Capital News Service, which was kind of a local news agency he was founding, um, he said, you know, you've done pretty well, as Chris will, you know, say subtly, and he noted, I'd been through a lot of change and turmoil in an, in an industry that is now seemingly constantly changing. So, of course, this got me thinking even more. I found myself in recent weeks, as I was preparing to come here, um, aside from preparing for a wedding, also thinking about speaking here, um, but the idea of surviving 20 years in journalism. And the first thing I thought was, surely somebody should have fired me by now. Uh, it's amazing I've gone on that long. But yet that period has also been one of the most tumultuous and exciting times in the industry. And the tumult just keeps on coming. So while I have a great job, let's be clear that no job in journalism these days is for the faint of heart or the weak stomached. It's a bit of a roller coaster with a lot of distracting noise. And it certainly doesn't have the same traditional career roots that it did uh, just a few years ago, several years ago. So tonight I thought I'd try to do what journalism can often do best. And probably many of you do very well which is to tell a complicated story simply with a beginning, middle, and an end. Hopefully you'll feel good when you're done, but won't be able to stop thinking about it, and you will have information you didn't have when you started the evening. And I'll try to do all this briefly so I can take your questions and we can talk more. I really am not going to ramble on for that long. First, I'm going to start with a video. Um, what I'm going to show you, this is something that I, um, let me make sure here. Yeah, so that's my intro slide. Um, uh, this is something I executive produced and I presented last year at several meetings, uh, including the annual Sportel conference in Rio and Monaco, which as you can imagine, those were very difficult gigs. 
um, and some International Olympic Committee meetings. Uh, this video has been used also by several other groups, including the NFL owners. So it's about five minutes long, and then I'll come out of that and talk a little more.
Thanks for enduring that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I did that. I did that a year ago. I presented that video first a year ago, um, in May of 2013. And actually, the numbers not only hold true; they've, they've actually gone up. And what we saw in Sochi was more interest than ever before. Um, and what we're expecting for the World Cup, which is only um, about six to eight weeks away, depending how you're doing the math on when it actually starts, in terms of interest, uh, it's going to be high for that as well. So I'm going to talk tonight um, by starting on where we are today and the big transformation we just watched. I mean, all of this, the amazing thing is, all of this just happened. We, t we take a lot of this for granted right now, but this really, this whole transformation happened within the past 15 years, and particularly the last four to five is where all this really just warped everything on how we're consuming information. And I think for all the students who are going out into this world, it's only going to continue. And the adaptation is really still just starting um, in the marketing world, advertising, and in journalism. And the marketing and advertising enables us to do the journalism. It supports uh, what we do. I didn't realize I had people up there, too. So this is, this is a great place you guys have. Um, so without blinding you with statistics, we all know this. There's more news and information produced daily than any time in history, and people have more methods to get information than ever before. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. And there's a perception that everyone is in digital overload, and it's overwhelming all of us. Yet recent surveys show that one of the top things people do on their devices and enjoy doing is staying on top or in touch with the news across all kinds of content areas and formats. It's becoming an expectation, actually, I mean, if you think about it, what good are these devices if we can't get information that is of value? If life is just angry birds and grumpy cats, which for many people it is, then we know we are in trouble. We should fear for the republic at this point. Plus, all of us are settling into habits with devices and multiple platforms. And let's face it, news is part of that routine. So I want to show you this quick snapshot, which just came out. This is part of a survey from the American Press Institute and the AP NORC Center for Public Affairs Research. Uh, the AP is part of that. We do analysis and surveys um, around the country related to how people, all kinds of topics. This one had to do, about, had to do with uh, news consumption, and it's available online as a PDF. And what you're looking at here is that um, you know, the top there, I know may not be clear to everybody, is majority of Americans enjoy keeping up with the news. And then uh, the question is, in general, how much do you enjoy keeping up with the news? And so more than half the people enjoy keeping up with the news a lot, and then another 30% enjoy it to some degree. That means nearly 90% like to get news and information. And again, this shouldn't really, you know, I don't think I'm unearthing anything amazing here, but it goes along, this data goes along with what I'm hearing on my reporting beat, if you will. Even though I'm a managing editor, I still am a reporter at heart. And part of my job involves interacting with new technologies, startups, and venture capitalists to see what's going on in the world, particularly in media. In several conversations over the past few months, I've had people in those businesses telling me how their data shows news being among the top or at the very top of things people are, so are doing on social and mobile. It explains why you see so much venture capital flowing into media right now and many newsrooms trying to adapt. So there's an appetite for news, and yet we live in times in journalism where the models are falling apart and startups are abound. Layoffs are everywhere, and so are investments and jobs. In my corner of the world, I'm based in New York. Um, if you drive down the road to Newark, they just you know, chunked off, I think, about 25% of the staff. It was a high number. Um, in Philadelphia, they're struggling. But yet in, that, in the same area I'm in, if you're in New York, there's a huge number of venture capitalists, and they're hiring people, journalists, and they're doing all kinds of startups out there. And we're seeing that with Nate Silver's effort at 538, Ezra Klein, um, and a host of others. And, and it's still, you know, who knows how it's going to go with some other places. So how did we get here? And I'm not sure I need to explain that in detail to this group. But, you know, we all know cable, the internet, easy access to social media, YouTube, Twitter, and so on. A series of what I call wrecking balls to business models and journalism. I'm never so sure why we're shocked at this. As a former paper boy, I was always struck that a million bu uh, multi-billion dollar industry put the faith of its products in the hands of children delivering newspapers in the early morning hours of the day. Uh, for myself, I could barely get off to school, but to deliver a paper on top of it. It was an industry that was ripe for change when technology came rolling through. So without dwelling on that past too much, I do have advice for all of you stemming from my own experience of where we are now. I, with Greg, what Greg was saying about looking at you know, things that have happened in the past here and where we're going now, they, they connect. And you have to look in the rear view to move forward. 
Um, I came out of college in 1992, which is just before the internet took off. And I was told there were no jobs in journalism. And really, I was told this. I was told this by college advisors and journalism professors. Only a few editors and professors said to keep going and that there will always be, be a need for news and that I had to go after the jobs. So in the pre-internet days, I went after a job with Vigor. I literally drove around the deep south until I got hired and I showed up with a resume and clips and I did that. I look at LinkedIn now and think, frankly, you're all blessed that you don't have to do this journey. Um, but that's what you did. And then when technology blasted through, I was working in Florida and I'm telling you this because you all think right now, you may think, the technology is where it is, and this is where it all is for the foreseeable future. It's going to change more. It's going to keep changing, and I'm going to get into that more. So I want to scare you a bit in all this, too. Um, but what te when technology blasted through the industry when I was working in Florida, um, I did what some of my colleagues were hesitant to do. I adapted. We launched a cable TV station and our newspaper, and I got involved. We launched a website, and I got involved. I took HTML classes at a local community college to understand technology better, and I asked a lot of questions and adapted a road and rode the wave of technological changes rather than fearing it. I never claimed to be a technological genius and still don't, and I have family here who could attest to this. Um, and I avoided listening too much to the critics, those who questioned why anyone would move from print into digital. And believe me, as, as you think about that now, there were actually people who questioned why you would do this. And you know, those of us saw that this thing was all moving into digital and broadcast and TV. And those who pronounce, you know, there's many who now, even I work at the Associated Press, who pronounce me dead for years and wonder how I'm even still employed at the oldest news agency in the world. But how, you know, throughout all that, and this goes back to what Greg was saying, I never strayed from the core of journalism, which is getting the facts, getting the truth, and telling a story. And no matter the story, no matter the platform, and so in recent years, even with all this, and I get asked to speak about these things a lot, where technology's going, where news is going, I've had to keep adapting and keep reporting on my beat, venture capitalists and startups, to see where the AP should be going, where the industry should be going. Because it really is a game of survival to keep these models going. The business models that enables you to all go out and report stories. And trust me, you don't, I've worked in places where you don't have journalists, or you don't have free speech, and it doesn't work the same, and it's not a democracy, and it's not as free. So you want this to work. And I'm frankly counting on all of you to figure out the next models ahead of us. So, you know, where we should keep going, I look at social media, the proliferation of video and user-generated content, all of which have un upended newsrooms. And for me, I look at all of these as opportunities. Before the term citizen journalism was commonplace, I remember my amazement that we could seek out digital images from viewers when I ran a TV station in hurricanes. And we had people email them in, and then social media came and made it even easier. I thought this was heavenly. So my point here isn't to reminisce, but this, adapt. All of you need to be willing to adapt. And I think all of you generally are if you're in this now, but don't think that where you are right now in this technology is just gonna stay there. And be willing to change, take advantage of the opportunities amid the chaos, and you're really entering this incredible but difficult time in journalism. And here's why, and here's another chart from that survey I wanna show. So this is, most Americans use many media devices for news. The question is, please tell me if you use each device or technology to get, there's actually a typo in here, which is kinda of funny, to get news in the last week, or if you did not, and if you could see it goes all over the place. I mean, TV still leads the pack. Laptops, and we keep hearing that's diminishing because as tablets come on and mobile devices, um, papers still hold true. It depends. And as you go into the survey, and I really recommend uh, taking a look at it. I've read the thing. I'm not a total nerd, but I've read the thing twice. And it's, um, it's fascinating because it gives you a reflection of why people go to these different things, whether it's a live news event, whether it's more reflective, whether it's looking forward. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, throughout this too is scattered things like, you know, was this from a traditional news source? Was it from social media? That sort of thing. So, you know, what I would say here is this, you know, across devices, everybody is pursuit of the, in pursuit of the same thing, which is accuracy and correct information out there when they want news. Um, 
And the survey reflects that. And this requires all journalists to think differently about how their stories are being consumed and to realize that different people consume different things at different times depending on the content they're looking for. And we see this repeatedly with stories. The Boston bombings were consumed across platforms. Incredible sources were sought out, even amid, people forget, amid a storm of social media sleuthing. Uh, the same held true for the Malaysia plane uh, disappearance and the recent Sochi Olympics. And in both cases in AP, uh, for AP, um, the stories that got most, the most attention involved information no one else had, angles that others didn't pursue. Because in this mess, you end up with a lot of the same information. So as journalists, you need to be the ones getting stuff that nobody else is getting. Requires source development, requires looking at stories differently. And if you're just doing what everybody else is, you're toast. So finally, you know, what does this mean for all of you in the road ahead as I'm kind of lecturing here? I apologize for that. I have a few key pointers and takeaways, um, and though I never can predict the future. I did finish third in my basketball bracket, which was really good. But that's as far as it goes. I predicted that Joe Girardi would have been fired in mid-2009, and he ended up winning the World Series that year. So take it with a grain of salt, but these are the takeaways I have for this business. In journalism, first do the basics in the business and then some. What I mean by that is this. Learn how to do news no matter what the content or format area. My first job was covering business news in North Carolina, then education in Florida, police, and courts. It then involved, evolved into digital and TV and into other content areas where knowing the basics really mattered. You can't cover sports, entertainment, or business with news without knowing how to deal with public records or court clerks. Learn the basics, learn how to pursue public records, know the value of visuals, learn how it all works. You know, I oversee content areas now, sports, business, entertainment, lifestyles, I deal with social media, um, these big events. I, I didn't start in any of that. I started a small paper. But you, and, and I realized that path, I started at the beginning, that path has changed. For a lot of students now, starting at a small paper and cutting your teeth doesn't exist the same way. But you all need to find a path to do that because to get to these bigger things that you want to do, you have to start knowing the basics. But I didn't start covering sports or entertainment, um, yet I've been to the Olympics and the Globes because they're news stories and they're powerful news stories that can consume by a lot of people across all these devices. Next, don't be afraid to try new things, but don't stray from the core principles of journalism. And I think Greg hit on this earlier. Tell the truth, get it right. This idea of something might be right, it, as acceptable, is absurd. And it erodes your credibility. And if you come at a time in your career where you're thinking something might be right and I'll publish it, don't do that. Because it hurts the business, it hurts you, and it raises too many questions, no matter the format or platform. And if somebody tweeted it, it doesn't make it right. Um, so stick to your standards and principles and try the new to figure out how you can create sustainable business models, whether you're a basic journalist reporting in the field or you're leading these organizations. Make your standards a central part of what you do in your product. And be willing to change. Over the years, I've had to convince people to go on air, to write for the web, to consider mobile and social media essential. I find myself now having discussions about how written stories need to be shorter and may need visuals that involve data in addition to videos and photos. Those who are willing to try the new to experiment, I find are rewarded in the long term and are far better reporters and journalists. My gut tells me they tend to be more open-minded people. And they're essential to building new businesses in journalism, which are going to be needed. I have two more points and then I'm wrapping up. I think you all know this, but, and I, I touched on it a bit, but change will be relentless in the years ahead, just as it has been. I'm finding myself looking at things in journalism that need to go away because technology has enabled them to happen. Automation of data-driven content, for instance, the idea that you can take data and formulate a story. There are two companies doing this in the United States right now and elsewhere. And that's going to replace certain things that aren't needed anymore by journalists. But what we still need journalists to do is dig. My theory is that by getting rid of data processing type stories or content journalism, we will free people to focus on doing the type of reporting that results in news and information that others do not have, that is of real value to people. 
Until computers can fully ferret out the incompetence or corruption of politicians and other leaders, then journalists will be needed. As I tell my friends and family often, I, you know, I'm employed often by the stupidity of others. Not for hiring me, but for what goes on in journalism. Finally, be outgoing and engaging. I'm finding more and more the successful modern journalist can talk to just about anyone, whether it is a CEO or a person on the street. You need a social media presence. You need to know how to tweet smartly. I'm assuming by the time you guys graduate, you can do that. But you also need to know how to talk and engage with people to be good journalists. Write them notes. Visit them in person. Half of my career, the success was showing up at the office, meeting the clerk, uh, court clerks, the judge's secretaries, so you get the phone call when it matters. So this all may sound like I'm suggesting you do it all. Be good human beings, know how to communicate, be a good journalist, and I guess that's because I really am. You have to engage with all the different formats in the content areas and understand how what you report um, and do will be consumed. It will impact the journalism you do, even though that journalism has to remain true to its core. I hope that makes sense to people. But you really have to kind of do this in a way that didn't exist when I entered journalism, or Chris or others who've been in the field. So I'm hoping this was helpful. I looked over what I presented here a few times in preparation, and frankly, I'm not sure I'm revealing anything new. A lot of this you know, but sometimes we need someone to connect the dots and tell the story like a journalist is supposed to. So I'm happy to take questions or discuss anything you guys would like at this point. Oh, I had these bullet points planned, but I completely forgot about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess I should have asked, I should have said too, if you're a journalist, you have to ask questions. A ask Chris. Uh, Chris gave me a tour. I don't know if he's here, but uh, Chris gave me a tour, and I, I must have asked him 50 questions about everything we were doing. I found at least three business opportunities I need to talk to him about, and I found out new things you guys were doing here that I didn't realize before. Always ask questions. Mr. Catronio, Ms. Kurth, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Bilker, you've all disappointed me greatly. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Catronio, you've got a question. Yes. Uh, with, with Rob going around the One second, let me bring it up there. We have to do it for taping. <laughs> As you can tell, Greg and I are kind of a hardcore crowd from the AP. We're rather relentless on all of you, ask questions. It's okay. He's relentless on us and JMC too. That's well, good. So he should be. It's with Sochi and the drama going on with the reporters' hotels, and now the drama with Rio and how it may not be ready. Where's the challenge in still reporting in the good news and making sure that it doesn't put a cloud over the spectacular event that it is? Yeah, you know that is a that's a good question because that does become a challenge. Uh, let me take a hit of water in this way, and, and I think we do this well at the AP because we actually make a concerted effort. The story is not about the media at these events, first of all. So when we showed up in Sochi and all these hotel problems were going on, if you look back at what we reported at least, we weren't part of that chorus of insanity, right? And actually there was a site that did a debunking that like 75% of the photos that got all shared by everybody were actually false. Um, they were shots from other things or events that happened previously and made, tried to make Sochi look bad. Um, we, and, and I, drive, I drove this in Sochi and I'll drive it again in Brazil with my staff there, is that the story isn't about us and we're telling all sides of the story. And so we are not the American news agency when we show up there. We tell the Russian side as well as we tell every other country side there. And we don't dwell, I mean, these events are all gonna have problems. I've not been to an event that doesn't have a problem of some sort. If you remember before London, the fear was the buses would blow up, the tubes would blow up, there'd be security problems, and um, transportation would be hell. And in the ramp up, all that was you know, beaten around. And what tends to happen is all the journalists show up at the event, and they have nothing else to report, so they report on themselves. We go away from that. We do a lot of planning in advance, so we are focused on the whole picture, and that, um, and we made a real effort to do that. And frankly, the hotel things in Sochi, I think 
the statistics we had were that one to two percent of hotel rooms had problems in Sochi. Um, they did not involve the athlete village in general. They involved uh, journalists. Um, and frankly, at those numbers, if you were looking at them as an informed journalist, you'd say, well, why would I care? But it got all this attention because journalists, I felt, some of who weren't really responsible about it, saying, look at these nightmarish conditions. Okay. The, the, what we should have been focused on is we spent $51 billion and this thing isn't completely done yet. We did that story. And what were the problems and why didn't it get done? And then we moved on quickly because there were bigger issues. But you, you really, I think it's important, and for all of you who go into the, into the business and into the field on this, don't get caught up in that. And I see it happen all the time on Twitter and on social media. Just don't get caught up in that. I, I, I mean, it's crazy. I, I, Greg can tell you too, I've had, we've had numerous instances. I had some, uh, I took some heat for this. I had some, uh, we had some staffers who were arrested at Occupy Wall Street several years ago and people were tweeting this and retweeting this. And I told people to knock it off. That was my quote, got passed around, knock it off. Um, and the reason was we knew none of the details of what happened on this. And we didn't know what happened and our staffers, we didn't know if they were in trouble or in jeopardy. And I didn't want anyone from uh, uh, the city or NYPD reading our tweets about these things happening the wrong way. I mean, and, but people are getting caught up in things. And I think as journalists, in the, what's moving ahead with what you're seeing with what I showed you in the video, everybody needs to take a breath sometimes and not get caught up in that. I hope I'm answering your question. I know I'm being long-winded. Yes, right here. Do I just point at this one? Oh, oh, let's do the one. Sorry, we'll do the one on top. Sorry, we'll one. Um, you said that at the core, audiences want news and facts that are true, and um, you didn't really say this, but objective. And so, what do you think about the growing um, like partisanship of news with MSNBC and Fox News and more audiences choosing to cater to their personal beliefs in regards to news and what they see? I think that's always happened. I mean, you know, people see it on a large scale now because of um, Fox, MSNBC, other outlets that, that either through their own admission or through the perception or their branding have a slant. Whether you have a slant or not, I'm not the judge of that, but there's that perception out there. Um, but if you go back through the history of journalism, that's, I mean, the whole founding of newspapers was basically so people could give their opinions on what they wanted. So that, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, I think it's up to the readers and the viewers to, and you see that, to discern where they're gonna get their information from and what sources they're gonna get from. And I, I'm finding now, it's interesting you should raise that because um, I started taking over business news about six months ago. And we did some survey and analysis. We talked to our customers. We're mainly a business to business, a B2B structure. There's a rekindled interest in business news, really accurate information about business news. And I'm not just talking about the data or earnings reports, right? But news and information from the business world. And the reason is, I think, my theory is, we are all individually responsible now for our finances in ways we never have been before. So people seek out that accurate information. So for us at the AP, look, we're Switzerland. We're, you know, we're neutral. We are, um, you know, all those, those networks you named are customers. They're good customers. And they're good news outlets. I know a lot of people at both of them. But I think for us, you know, for me at least, I like being on the middle. Um, I liked being in Russia and and being in the middle. I, I don't root for teams anymore. I gave that up, you can ask my family. I, you know, I really don't care. I really more want to see a good game. Uh, and it's the same with news. And I, um, I like, I think for journalists to keep out of being slanted is just report out all sides of the story and let it tell the story. Yeah, do we have the mic down here? Hi, okay, so going back to your career advice, I know that you really want like a well-rounded individual at the AP, but is there any one of those traits that sticks out a little bit more than the other? Or is it they, like when you go to hire somebody, is it literally like they need every single one of these? Like, You know, I'll tell you, I get asked that a lot. I, I get to hire people and recruit people, and the number one thing I look for is 
For me, I look for smart and engaging people because I feel like if they have the communication skills and they're that a, a certain type of person, then, um, you know, and then I look at their work. I mean, I look at their work before they come in the room, so I've already seen that they can write, I see that they can report, I see they can produce video, I see they shoot video, they've won prizes, they've done X, Y, and Z. So by the time you're coming to me, I'm looking at how you are, how you interact, and how you interview with all my colleagues, which is, if you think it's me and Greg, it's like, you know, you, some people I feel like we put through the ringer, it's just uh, brutal. Um, and that's a good thing. But I really look for people who are smart, who are thinking ahead, who are engaged in the current landscape and are looking at the big picture. Um, and who have real, and the reason, let me, I'm st stammering a bit, but, but the reason I say that is source development to me is still the number one thing you can do in journalism. Everyone I know who breaks news, who gets information that nobody else has, has really good sources really exquisite sources, and they can get a phone call. And I know Greg sees this too, he sees it, you see it with staff. And you can, you know, you can see staff who are really good and they have the sources. And so I, I look for people who are gonna be like that. And I ask them about their sources. And I, I look for people who are gonna do that sort of thing. Because the other stuff, there's a lot of technical skills you can all learn. You can all learn how to do things right on social. You can look at trend lines. You can look at social flow data. You can look at how to produce a video, use Final Cut, these things. They're all learnable. But how to be a reporter and do the journalism and look for documents, file a FOIA document, Freedom of Information Act request, those things are the things that make the difference to me. One more question. How do you feel about blogging? Uh, like it's how fine. It it's fine. Actually, I should have said this. If I was a student journalist, you should all have blogs and you should be publishing all kinds of stuff. I, I know you have, there's various, uh, for lack of a better term, products you have here at the school, and that's great. But I think the amazing opportunity you have as a student journalist is you actually have the ability to do reporting right now and publish things. And I think that's a field worth exploring. You know, I, I don't have a problem with blogging. I mean, we don't, you know, some bloggers break dues. If you can make a life out of that, that's great. News is hard work. Yes? The majority of the content coming out of wire services like the AP is by nature really general and just like an overview of a story that's going on. Is there room to innovate and expand more into database journalism or explanatory pieces? Yes, and I'd actually disagree with you um, in this way. First of all, our business, when I joined the AP, it was something like 85% of our revenue came from newspapers. 50% of our revenue is currently from broadcast customers, video customers. Um, I don't know if we're, I think, the largest video news producer, or if number one or number two video news producer in the world. Um, we've diversified over time. Same with photos, it's like 20% of our business. And data journalism, I oversee that area um, with interactives, and um, we're doing a lot there too. We've innovated over time, we're res responsible for election results, among other things. Um, so I don't feel like we're in a, if anything, in fact, Greg and I were just talking about this story, for example, out of Albuquerque, where they have this systemic problem, um, seem to have a systemic problem with, with shootings from the police. Um, I think it's like 36 injured, 24 killed over a period of years, which is staggeringly high numbers. Um, you know, that's the story in general terms, and we were just talking about, like, well, what's the story we need to go after there? And so part of the thing we're doing now at the AP is there's always going to be breaking news, which is, say, the Utah mom who killed her kids. A horrific story. That news breaks, you cover it. And then there's things we dig and unearth, and we go after, and we hit beyond. We did that in Sochi. We do that with baseball. We do it with entertainment, because we know all this other stuff is just going to be out there. Oh my God. Yeah. something that no one else has. Right? So if you see a void in that coverage, and I'm really disappointed in you because you didn't introduce yourself. <laughs> if you see a void in the coverage, try to fill that void. And that will make you stand out. And then if you can stand out and you back it up with the basics. One of these that keeps jumping into my mind is Ride the Wave. 
I do not know how to fly an airplane, but I do know that it's the best way to get to London. So I don't need to know about every single piece of technology as it emerges and be the best user. I just need to be able to understand how I can take what that technology delivers and put it into play for what I'm trying to accomplish. That to me is riding the wave. Then as you're riding the wave, filling gaps in coverage that you, you see, hey, look, I really want to know that. Nobody's telling me that. How can I find out a way to answer that question for the world? I think now you're starting to distinguish yourself and you're making people like Lou pay attention. There was another couple of questions. Hi. Hi. You mentioned that when you were leaving um, college, your professors were telling you that there weren't jobs in journalism. And I was just curious your views on the job opportunities now and how that differed back when you were first starting out. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time. And let me give you some backstory on that. At the time, uh, in the early 90s, it was, uh, it was a recession. It's what mainly cost Bush the election at the time uh, when Clinton ran against him. And, and uh, you know, the slogan was, it's the economy, stupid. That's where that came from. And, so the recession was hitting papers really hard. And this is, they were cutting jobs right and left. And um, so that's a backstory on that because people just saw this shrinking and that the peak was over. Um, uh, it's funny because several years later, I was working for the Times Company in Florida and we had stock and the stock went through the roof and the stock split and everything. I think the opportunities now are amazing. I think they're tougher and different, but here's why. There's more potential to take some risk now than there was then. There was, even though there was one clear path at the time, which was you went to a small TV station, you went to a small radio station, newspaper, whatever. Now there are just a lot of places that are hiring really smart people who know how to do journalism. The other thing is, if you, there's, there's two paths I see, which is there's kind of core journalism, which is like the AP, right? Or NBC News or something of that nature, the BBC. And then there are other paths, um, and Chris and I were talking about this earlier, I was talking about it with, with someone at University of Maryland recently, where one of the number one hiring areas right now for sports journalism uh, majors is the actual teams and the leagues themselves, because they have entire media operations. Um, I saw Mark Haas from Edelman was here a couple weeks ago, um, and he and I have talked occasionally, and you know the brands are hiring people too. I think it's a matter of what everyone, what all of you decide what the type of journalism you want to do. I have a good friend of mine um, uh, who is currently like the head video guy for Southwest Airlines and used to be a hardcore video journalist for the AP. And he made a choice that he was done with news journalism as he knew it and loves what he does at Southwest. And um, I think there's, there's more communications and jobs like that than ever before. And then on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, there's things like um, you know, ProPublica and other startup sites, Nate Silvers I mentioned, Ezra Klein's, there's the PayPal guy doing his thing, and there's all this stuff going on. Um, but I think it's a matter of what your appetite is for trying the new and, and seeing what's going on. Question about blogs. Yeah. Would you need a blog to be very standard? Or if you had someone who was blogging with a voice that we wouldn't use on the AP wire, it's not a standard, traditional, journalistic voice, would that disqualify, disqualify somebody from entry? You mean for a job at the AP? Yeah, yeah, or for, just, yeah, for opportunities in the profession. No, actually, what, the only thing that's disqualified is raging political slants, basically. I mean, really, I, at that point, it's, it's a tough bridge to cross. Um, but in general, no, if it's a unique or different, and I've hired people, and I actually look for people in those zones, um, because I don't want the standard fare all the time. Another question? Uh, yeah, I'm Jacob Garcia, and kind of building off of the 538 and Nate Silver, you talked about startup companies and uh, their recent success, and I guess, 538 really isn't a good example since I, I'm pretty sure they were bought, bought out by ESPN. But in terms of the other startup companies that aren't necessarily 
uh, composed of those kind of professional journalists, uh, what can the AP offer that they can't in terms of access and in coverage of, of sports specifically? I guess I'm confused by your question. What does the AP offer for access? What, what, what does the AP offer that, say, a startup cannot in terms of coverage of sports? Well, we're, I think, frankly, particularly in the United States, we're the dominant sports agency. I mean, you look at all the, the networks and the channels, and I'll talk about Nate Silver in a second because I think you may be missing something there. Um, but ESPN, Fox, CBS, all of them take AP. They count on us. I interviewed all of our top 10 customers last year in sports. They need the AP, and the reason is we have the breadth of coverage. We cover every um, MLB game, NBA game, NFL game. Um, we cover the NHL, we cover tennis, golf, we cover everything. We cover the top 25 teams. We are the top 25. People forget that. AP top 25. Uh, so when ASU shows up there, there's a reason. We have voters. It's the oldest credible poll in uh, America on sports polling. So um, I, think the, I think what we offer is that we are the AP, and which is why our hiring standards are so high. If you're representing the AP, whether it's Kansas City or um, whether it's Kansas City or some other market, the expectation is is that you can cover sports better than anybody in that market, and you're going to break more news. Well, getting back to Nate Silver a second, I think I think you may be missing something. He's still in startup mode. He worked out the deal to move from the Times to ESPN, but he's got his whole 538 scenario, and he's been flooded with some investment that he's hiring a lot of people. So I know this because some of my people are getting, you know. I'm competing for some of the same people he's hiring. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see what he does in the midterm elections and in the, um, in the national elections. Uh, that deal also, he's like a good example of a journalism startup. I mean, he went startup to the Times, to a big contract with ABC that took him across ESPN Entertainment um, and ABC Political. I mean, it, that is like a really, whatever you think about his content, whatever you think, whether it's right or wrong, um, or that it's good for journalism. The fact is he built a journalism model that's really went from startup to really high end to really across everything in a big deal. I don't know a lot of others who are doing that. I've never met him either. Uh, it, and clearly he's got good stuff ahead of him. Um, you kind of talked about being willing to change and kind of innovating with technology and everything. What's your perspective on um, more and more like written reporters having to do like photography as well and kind of like broadening their skill set into like um, computer languages and that kind of thing, being able to kind of be more forward with diversifying their talents? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I get asked that a lot because it's, you know, the idea that I need to do all the formats. I, I think it's, to me, it's like Darwinian evolution. There are going to be reporters who evolve into that. I have several, uh, or know several staffers um, or several staffers that work for my teams. Um, and Greg has them on his teams, too, that do all formats. Um, you know, John Carucci and, and one of our um, journalists in New York covers entertainment news. The guy can write a great story, and he can do video, and he can shoot. He started as a photographer um, back when there was film. And so um, I think that's going to happen, and there's going to be more and more need for that. I was talking to your dean earlier about the fact that it's very competitive for data-driven journalism right now. It's the number one area where it's really competitive to hire uh, and find people who can balance everything and who can really drill down in data, maybe even code, maybe data visualization. Um, but then at the same time, I think there are going to be specialists. And the reason is this. Um, I've worked with a, a lot of great journalists, far better than me or that I will ever be. And it's humbling to work with them. And some of them are so good at their craft um, that you understand why there are specialists in those fields. If I look at David Gutenfelder's photos from North Korea, and David can write and he can do other things, but his art is his photography. And David is a very multi-talented guy. He was like Instagram photographer of the year by Time Magazine, all this stuff. Great guy, great photographer. But he's an artist when he's out there, when he's shooting this stuff. Um, and when I'm at the Olympics, if I look at David Goldman's work, what he did at the Olympics, you're going to have specialists who do that. And it's the same with video. 
So uh, to me, journalism is this great melting pot. You're going to have these people who do, you're going to have people who do multiple things. Um, but then you're going to have people who are really specialists in certain things, and that's okay. And, um, you know, I realize there are immense pressures on local markets right now to have everybody do everything, right? Uh, and that's because of the market conditions. So that's going to happen. And it's an evolutionary process. But I think for me, for someone like me or Greg or others, that's why this idea of riding the wave and to like keep changing, I mean, I had to learn a lot over time. I, when I, w I went to University of Maryland, and um, I learned print journalism. I learned nothing about video photography, and I had to learn all that when I got my jobs. And um, I think you have an opportunity now to learn it all before you go into that. Another question? Where's the mic? We have one over here. So you were talking earlier about um, recommending us to start blogging and take advantage of the fact that that's a technology we can use today. So I have a, I, I guess I have a worry, and I think other students may have this as well, that future jobs and employers, particularly if we write um, pieces which have an opinion or slant to them, that may come back to hurt us, um, just because as somebody who's interested in getting into politics or political journalism, I think that um, having uh, as I said, articles online with my name attached to it right now with a certain opinion that could change or that could be controversial going forward. Um, it's just something that I worry about and attaching my name to something right now before, before getting employed. Well, here's the thing. At some point, we cross some threshold where people interpret blog with opinion. You don't have to do any of the opinionated stuff. But what I am saying is you have amazing platforms that didn't exist before. You have WordPress and Tumblr that you can do storytelling in ways that could never be done before as student journalists. And I'm not saying you have to have opinions to go do that. I'm saying go out and do it. Do a story. If you want to learn how to do video, go do video. Do it with your iPhone. Start shooting it. Those are the things I'm talking about. So when I say blog, no one should interpret anything I say as go air your opinions. I have a Tumblr page. I post stuff to it. I have a Facebook page. I don't give my opinions on things, except personal things, like what my son puts on Facebook or these different things. Um, but I'm, what I'm saying is you have platforms, and I don't feel like enough young journalists are exploiting those to try this out. And if you want to be a photographer in particular or in video, those platforms are fantastic to do that. And it provides a showcase that didn't exist before. And if you're a writer and want to be a writer, you have that opportunity to do that. So that was my suggestion, because I don't think that comes back to haunt anybody. You know, if you say, I did a story on the homeless in Phoenix, right? And I put it on my Tumblr page, or I did it on my Facebook page. OK, great. You actually tried something different. So is it your line, observations are not opinions? Yes. That's, you know, I say these things, and I don't realize I'm going to be quoted so much. Because um, <laughs> it comes back to me uh, on Twitter, and it comes back to me at, like, I see people at the Olympics that I don't normally see all the time, and they say, oh, yeah, you've said whatever. Um, but yeah, I, 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 Oscar Garcia, uh, our news editor in Hawaii, who I saw in uh, Sochi and got to edit on a couple of stories he was working on, um, I said to him, I said something once where I said, well, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between um, when you're tweeting, giving observations and seeing things as they are versus giving your opinion. And so the example, I've used all kinds of examples. If I'm, if I'm watching the Oscars, this actually, I did this actually. Uh, so I'm watching the Oscars with my family. And I couldn't get enough of Pharrell's hat. You saw that hat, right? I mean, Pharrell's hat was just great, right? And I posted like, you know, wow, that is a hell of a hat. You know, like, wow, that's like a Smokey the Bear hat. And, you know, you're not giving your opinion. You're just like, that is a heck of a hat. And, and it was getting all this attention on Twitter. And, you know, there's a way to do it without being insulting, snarky, condescending. You don't need to do that. And if it's not that, when I was in Sochi, I was tweeting or posting about serious things that were going on, you know, without having to give opinion. Now, people like to grab on to the snark and the opinion. They love that, to the blog point I was making before. But there's a way you can do these things, and I think as journalists, that's okay. If it makes me a little more boring in the world, oh well, I'll live with that. But my job, and the way I make my money in this world for my company and for myself is that I'm reporting accurate news and information 
and I'm not giving my opinion on these things. And that's what I'm doing. And I don't think it has to be done on Twitter and these other things if you're a journalist. If you're a columnist, if you're Charles Blow, who I follow, or if you're some others, opinions all day. Here's another example of somebody who did something different, Charles. Yes. Charles Blow is a guy who started off doing graphics. He's with the New York Times now, and he's an opinion columnist. He started off doing graphics and interactives and presenting information using statistics in a graphic way. And from that began to write opinion columns using the graphics to support what he was showing. And again, this is just riding the wave. This is taking skills you have, seeing a void, attempting to fill that void, and creating a path for yourself where one previously didn't exist. I'd have to ask him, did he use a blog to do it? But, you know, that's, yeah. Charles Bull is a great example. Yeah. Were there other questions? We have time for one more question. Wow, an hour goes fast. <laughs> Anybody? No Sochi questions, World Cup. But Greg will tell you, I'll answer anything. He's been in meetings with me. I let staff ask me anything, finances, whatever. Things we screw up, things we do well. If not, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Appreciate it very much.